Do you ever stop and think about something you've been doing the same way for a long time and wonder, am I actually an idiot for doing this? Yeah, I had a moment like this recently, and it was all because of this thing in my head. Yes, a bike helmet. Yep, a bike helmet, a bike helmet, a bike helmet. So on my daily bike commute for the last number of years, I haven't worn a helmet, and I've been fine with that choice. I mean, I always wear a bike helmet when I'm mountain biking or road biking or where I'm really mixing with cars, but on my bike commute, which was mostly on pathways and safe protected bike lanes, it felt fine. But then something happened, and what happened was you. This channel started growing, and as it grew, I started getting more and more questions, and this is by far the most common question I get. Why don't I wear a bike helmet? For a long time, I didn't even want to address this issue. I just felt like a dead end. Everyone is so strident, and the culture of helmets is so embedded here in North America, it felt like a dead end. You know, I sometimes jokingly call it helmet fundamentalism, and I think that's actually a pretty good description. All of those questions just kept coming about why I don't wear a helmet, and it wasn't just the number of questions, it was the way they were asked. These were heartfelt pleas, there were angry rants, there were statements of concern for me, there were stories of near misses that were frightening. And then not just that, but people in my life as well, people in my family ask me why I don't wear a helmet. And honestly, it started to wear me down. And then one day it happened, it popped into my head. Are all of these people right? Am I actually an idiot for not wearing a helmet? And so I thought maybe it's time, not just to make a video about this, but to really explore this issue on a personal level to make sure that I'm doing the right thing. But I also knew I have my own biases on this, so I got some help. I asked a friend, Kaylin Klingbeil, who is a great journalist and researcher and really understands cities and cycling, and also wears a helmet all the time, but maybe most importantly, she's an independent third party. She's free of my biases, and I asked her to help me explore this question deeply. And so what follows is our conversation. And originally I was going to edit this into a short, punchy bunch of little factoids. But as I was editing, I realized there's so much nuance and depth to this conversation, to this issue, that I want to take some time on it. So get some popcorn or something and sit back and hopefully you'll get something out of this video, because I certainly did. And one last thing, thanks to all of you who have supported this channel through Super Thanks. And if you like videos like this, please consider hitting that Super Thanks button down below. Oh yeah, and subscribe too. Okay, so this is Kaylin. Hi, Kaylin. Hi, Tom. So Kaylin is uh, a freelance writer, uh, editor, an old colleague and friend of mine, and uh, also a cyclist, but you usually wear a helmet, right? I, t I tend to. <laughs> yeah, you tend to wear one, I tend not to. So I asked Kaylin to help because I've been sort of immersed in this for so long, I wanted to get free of my biases. So I asked Kaylin if she would help by sort of looking into some of the questions about bike helmets and help me determine if I really am an idiot for not wearing a helmet or not. So thank you for helping out on this. For sure. Well, let's dive in. Like, I want to get to those fundamental questions. But first, I wondered if we could maybe talk a bit about how did we get here? How did we get to this place where wearing a helmet almost seems like a requirement on a bike now? Sure, sure. That sort of question of where did helmet culture, um, helmet fundamentalism, if you will, come from is, is uh, I, I found that interesting to dive into. I like into. Helmet, helmet fundamentalism. <laughs> Let's call it that, yes. Uh, yeah, so there's an interesting confluence of events. Um, so there was a cycling boom in the United States in the early 1970s. This is when bike sales exploded, politicians planned for miles of urban bikeways, and bicycle brands like Cannondale, Specialized, and Track were all founded. This was like the 10-speed boom, right? When the 10-speeds came around? Exactly. And, and, and cycling became sort of an, an athletic thing for the first time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are several factors behind the boom, um, including environmental concerns. The first Earth Day was in 1970. Uh, and yeah, as you mentioned, health and fitness um, is on the rise, and bicycles themselves changed uh, with lightweight 10 speed bikes widely available. Right, and I guess the oil crisis was around that time too, and people were looking for alternatives to the car. Yeah, and bikes, um, yeah, bikes were also a relatively affordable major purchase right. um, for people in their teens and early 20s, uh, now, now baby boomers. Uh, this boom, uh, by the way, is all documented in the book Bike Boom by Carlton Reed. Shout out. That's a good one. So there's this bike boom um, and also plans for more separated bike lanes. And in Palo Alto, California, there's one man who begins vehemently fighting the bike lanes being built. Mm, I know where you're going with this. Any guesses on who that would be? <laughs> this would be Mr. Forrester, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. So this man, John Forrester, will be familiar to many cycling advocates. For those who don't know, he was an engineer who championed vehicular cycling believing cyclists fare best when they act and are treated as drivers of vehicles. Right, right. So he really advocated like 
taking your place on a road among cars and trucks, like taking your place in there. That was his philosophy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he wrote a handbook, um, just as you say, that emphasizes cyclists should not be afraid to cycle in traffic. Um, a quote from him, um, cyclists should resist being shunted off into government-sponsored bike paths as if they were incompetent children. Wow. Well, that is an ethos, I guess. <laughs> uh, so modern cycling advocates view Forrester as a pivotal player in stopping the progression of protected bike lanes in the U.S. Right. I guess that's really where we see that divergence between North America and Europe and some of the cities like Copenhagen, Amsterdam, really started building separated safe bike lanes at that time. Whereas here in North America, it was all about and not being a child or cyclist, taking your place on the road. Exactly. Right. Uh, yeah, so we have this bike boom, um, this man who hates bikes, John Forrester. And right around this time, there's also the introduction of the very first bike helmets, resembling what we still put on our heads today. So here we are now, the birth of the bike helmet. Yes. I remember those early helmets. They looked ridiculous. <laughs> uh, so in 1974, the Seattle-based outdoor company MSR created the first modern bike helmet. Um, so think more modern than what you might be picturing <laughs> yeah, okay. in your Thank head. Thank you for bringing me up to speed. Uh, and so, yeah, cycling, it was sort of inadvertent how it came about um, in that they had a new climbing helmet, uh, which cycling clubs started using and recommending. Um, and then started sending the company feedback, and that led MSR to make a bright yellow helmet just for biking. It had to be bright yellow, didn't it? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. uh, and the, the company um, documents this history on their website. Uh, they say the flashy helmets were loud declarations by the cycling community that safety was at the forefront of their now protected minds. I mean, I guess if you think about the transition from sort of the casual cycling culture before that to the athletic cycling culture now, you know, that quote makes sense in, yeah. in that context. Yeah. Yeah, but for the, for, for 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 the, the rest of us. For everyone else, it, make, it seems absurd. <laughs> um, so then in 1975, the motorsports brand Bell launched their first cycling-specific helmet called the Bell Biker. Um, and their helmet often overshadows MSR's helmet as the first bike helmet, perhaps because Bell still exists. Right. Um, MSR still does, but they do not sell bike helmets anymore. Keep in mind, Bell was a company all about speed. Bell's founder started manufacturing helmets after a close friend was killed in a car racing accident. And by 1961, their helmet line included models for auto racing, hockey, skiing, skydiving, baseball, and football. So, Wait, are you saying a car crash <laughs> led to the development of bike helmets? <laughs> in, in a roundabout kind of yeah, way? Yeah, it took, took a few years to get there. Um, but yeah, helmets right. for lots of sort of more intense activities, such as skydiving. I guess we're in Canada. That's when hockey helmets came around too, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so helmets exist just as you have more people riding bikes, as well as um, this vocal advocate, John Forrester, saying that to cycle effectively, you need to ride on roads. So these factors all worked well in the helmet's favor. If you're going to ride with vehicles, why not wear this newfangled device on your head? Right, and it's a new product to sell as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And plus that bike boom I mentioned went bust, and all those promised bike lanes didn't appear. So there just weren't many options for riding other than on roads. Right. And, and athletic cycling was still a thing. I, that's right around the time of the mountain bike boom too, which is all about speed. And of course, people wear mountain... Even I wear a helmet when I'm mountain biking. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, exactly. It's sort of this confluence of events um, and this wear a helmet message gets adopted across the English speaking world. Right. Um, fast forward a little bit, but it, it eventually leads to legislation mandating helmets, first in Australia in 1990, then in several Canadian provinces starting in the mid 1990s. So, so no Australia longer. was the first one yeah. to have a helmet legislation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and no, no longer just helmet culture, it's it's now the law. I mean, it's you can think about how hard it would be at that time to argue against helmets. Like, what's, what's you know, if every if all the momentum is about mm -hmm. safety, to argue against it, you'd seem like a crazy person. <laughs> so you could see how that momentum would carry itself into legislation. Yeah, and, and exactly. We, like, also just think of the environment we're cycling in in North America versus in Europe. Um, we don't, at, at that time, there was not the safe in infrastructure, so... Yeah. Yeah, it sort of made sense if, to if put a helmet on. mixing with cars every day, yeah, it makes sense. And it's also another factor is that helmets and head injuries start to become heavily researched. Um, and that seems to further this sort of aggressive helmet promotion, the idea that wearing a helmet is the main safety measure for people on bikes. Uh, and emergency room doctors start to weigh in. So as Peter Walker points out in his excellent book, How Cycling Can Save the World. Shout out. An ER doc is precisely <laughs> the wrong person you should ask about whether helmet use should be compulsory. That's because they see only one rare and extreme side of what is um, a complex and nuanced issue. So who better than an ER doc? Is there someone better than that to ask? <laughs> there is. Um, in his book, Walker does speak to a, a, an ER doc, but also another doctor, a public health expert who specializes in physical activity. Um, and so this specific public health doctor, Dr. Harry Rudder, 
told him how helmets do not create safety. Um, quote, only a safe environment free from the dangers created by motorized traffic and poorly designed roads can do that. Oh, that's an interesting. To look at it from a public health lens, we're getting more people out and active is the goal versus the consequences of an accident. Yeah, very different ways of looking at it from, like neither are wrong, but they're just different perspectives different, on it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think also keep in mind what's easy here. Um, is it easier for governments to um, sort of offload their responsibility and tell us to wear helmets or to build carefully engineered bike infrastructure? Right. And same thing for research. Is it easier to study people who come to an emergency department um, with or without helmets or to measure the effectiveness of bike lanes? Uh, you hate to think that it comes down to what's easiest, but of course it does. <laughs> like, like, we're all humans, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I spoke about all this with Dr. Kay Teschke. Uh, she's a professor emeritus at the University of British Columbia. And yeah, I've spoken to her before. Yeah. She does some great work on this. Yeah. yeah, she initiated the Cycling in Cities Research Program um, in 2004. Uh, and the program focused on factors that encourage or discourage cycling. So that included studying bicycle helmet laws in Canada um, and also sort of looking at route designs and if that increases or decreases um, risks of cycling injuries. Her work has shown how the emphasis on helmets um, distorted the cycling injury focus to one type of injury. We just talked about head injuries. Right. What, what, Only head injuries. Yeah, yeah. What the helmets there for. And also sort of a distortion to injury mitigation post-crash rather than preventing crashes and all types of injuries in the first place. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, you, all the attention is always on the consequences of the crash and we don't spend any time talking about preventing the crash. Exactly. Right. Yeah, and yeah. so she's incredibly familiar um, with how helmet culture dominates many people's thinking, including um, in the research world. Creating things becomes a mantra, and then it's very hard to overcome them, she told right. me. Right, and you see it reflected in any time there's a, a news story about a yeah. uh, cycling collision. It mentions whether the rider has a helmet or not. It all sort yeah. of stems from the same place, I think. And uh, to be honest, that is a factor <laughs> in me wearing a helmet, is, right. is knowing if you ever got in a crash. What would people say? <laughs> people would ask if you're wearing a helmet or not, they as would. awful as that is. I do think about this. Yeah. YouTuber dies in crash not wearing yeah. a helmet. Yeah. yeah, it's something to think about for sure. Yeah. Okay, so that was great. That really brings us to where we are now. This is how we came to helmet <laughs> fundamentalism. I don't think I'd ever sort of connected all those dots before, so that's really helpful. Thank you. Uh, so I guess the next question on my mind is, does a helmet actually work? Like, does in a crash, will a helmet protect you? That's kind of a seems, dumb, is that a dumb no, question? No, it's, it seems like it should be a straightforward question. Um, this one, I went down quite the you, rabbit you hole. You went down the rabbit hole on this one? Uh, okay, so, so at, in answer to your question, there is consistent evidence helmets reduce the odds of a head injury after a crash. Sure. But by how much? That's not as clear cut. Um, and keep in mind here, falling off a bike and hitting your head is rare to begin with. Right. That is a good point. <laughs> uh, so there's a long-standing claim that bicycle helmets prevent 85% of head injuries and 88% of brain injuries. So that sounds like a no-brainer. Pretty, pretty high. Um, and this number does, uh, it, it comes from a 1989 study out of Seattle published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, and so the, those high numbers um, definitely help spur the bike helmet fixation. But the study's design has been criticized and efforts to replicate those results have never reached such high numbers. Oh, wow. There's been several other summaries reviewing the research since then, um, and the evidence consistently shows helmets reduce the risk of a head injury. So yes, they do, um, but by a lower estimate of about 60%. 60%. Um, but that 85% claim from 1989 has been so heavily repeated by public health advocates, government websites, the news media, um, that it's definitely a factor in, in driving our helmet culture. Um, and I thought it was interesting to find out that one organization, the Washington Area Bicyclist Association, um, felt that they needed to correct, they needed to try and correct this misinformation. Um, they felt it was providing a false sense of security to bicyclists and distracting from other safety measures. So they went so far as to file a petition under the Federal Data Quality Act so that the federal government's National Highway Tra Traffic Safety Administration would stop spreading the claim. Oh, wow. So they felt so yeah. strongly about it that it was so distracting from other yeah. conversations they went up to fix, correct the record. They did. So keep in mind, it's exceedingly rare you'll be seriously injured or killed on a bicycle. Right. In Dr. Teschke's Canadian analysis of helmet wearing, which looked at five years of data from 2006 to 2011, the cycling hospitalization rate was 633 per 100 million trips. Okay. That's just hospitalization rate. Hospitalization rate, rate. 633 for every million trips. 100 yes. million. 100 million. Bicycle trips. Okay, exceedingly rare, yes. And of those hospital trips, 
of those 633, yeah. um, only 25% involved an injury to the head or the face. Oh. So the absolute risks of a cycling f uh, fatality and serious head injury are low. Are pretty low. And, I, and again, I think our, it, they, they make news when they happen. They're terrible when they do happen. And I think we all hear about that and, and respond. Yeah, yeah. But also speaks to the way we assess risk too. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so overall, the thing I took away from my, what turned into a deep dive into <laughs> um, helmet effectiveness studies is that yes, a helmet will help protect your head if you're in a crash, but your head is just one body part that can be injured and helmets only protect you after you've been in a crash. They don't protect you from having a crash in the first place. There's other factors in injury prevention, but we barely give them any thought because the wear a helmet message is so loud. Uh, so yeah, I, I sort of came away just thinking helmets have really become a huge diversion from other injury prevention interventions. Which we never seem to talk about. It's also with the focus on helmets just takes away from everything. Yeah, that's really interesting. So in a crash, it will help. Yeah. Maybe not as much as you think, Yeah. Uh, but there's other things that we need to be looking at as well. Exactly. That's what you took away from it? Yes. Right. Okay, so if that's the consequence of a helmet in a crash, and, and we're saying we're, we're, it does distract from other safety measures, what are those? Like, what other things go into it? Like, what are we not thinking about? Sure, yeah. So for other factors in injury prevention, um, a really big one is where do you ride? Are you riding on separated bike infrastructure? Are you on a quiet street with low vehicle speeds and volumes? Um, how are you riding? Are you sober? What is your speed? Do you have lights on your bike? That's, that's another very big one. Lights on your bike. Yeah. Yeah. And being sober. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So but you don't hear about this, though. No, we hear about, <laughs> we hear about, we hear about helmets, helmets all the time. Yeah. Uh, it's relevant here um, to look at studies on bike shares, where the research tends to show people are less likely to wear helmets. You're talking about those bike share bikes uh, where you rent them for yeah. a half hour at a time, and most, most cities have some kind of bike share now. Yes. And yeah. even though, I, at least in Calgary here, they come with helmets, lots of people don't put them on. Who right. wants to put on a helmet? everyone else has worn. Yeah, and in some places they don't have them at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah you have to bring your own and that's right. not the most convenient. Um, right. So there have been a few studies that have uh, looked at injuries of, of people on bike shares and the serious injury and fatality rate is lower. So this could be because bike shares, bikes themselves tend to be clumsy and bigger, which you end up riding slower. slower. Yeah. 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 Uh, the bikes have running lights and riders also sit in a more upright position. Um, so these are all factors in riding that get overlooked when the only piece we hear again and again is wear a helmet. So bike share bike fatality rates are lower than the usual cycling fatality rates. Yeah, so and you have to ask why yeah. Why is that when the people aren't wearing helmets? When they're, not, when they're not wearing helmets, yeah, yeah interesting. Um, so Dr. going back to Dr. Teshki, um, she has also studied the connection between helmet laws across Canada, because um, there's differences province by province, um, and the cycling injury hospitalization rates. Helmet laws are not associated with reduced hospitalization rates. They're not? No, they're not. So we live in a province that does not have a mandatory helmet law. Unless you're under 18. Unless you're under 18 for yeah. adults. But our, the neighbor next to the west, BC, does. Yeah. But hospitalization rates are basically the same. Yes, I, I couldn't tell you the specifics, but in there's theory. not, yeah, there's not, <laughs> yeah. there's not big differences. Um, the study she did did find females had lower bicycling hospitalization rates than males, um, and that's consistent with results from other studies, and that's often attributed to more conservative risk choices. So again, it sort of comes back to how we choose to ride matters. Right, right. And the risks we take on the bike. Yeah. Right. Um, and again, it's useful here to look at places like Denmark and the Netherlands. Um, they have low, very low fatality rates, even though helmet use is rare and there's a larger proportion of trips by bike. So what's yeah. going on? You hear that everyone who visits there or rides a bike there is like, I can't believe nobody wears a helmet, but no one ever seems to get injured also. Yeah, and, and a lot of it comes down to um, where people ride. Separation of people on bikes from motorized traffic is common. Um, and another thing is studies also consistently show there's safety in numbers for cyclists. So sort of a, a critical mass. The more people you have riding, the safer it is for everyone. Yeah, that makes sense. Motorists get more used to seeing cyclists. Yeah. Uh, when, you're in, when you're in a group, you're going to be safer. Wait, are you saying that bike lanes are safe? <laughs> <laughs> Separated bike lanes might actually work? <laughs> Infrastructure. <laughs> Who knew? And so even though we're not in Europe, um, cycling is not inherently more dangerous than other forms of transportation. So I do, I do think there's an idea. I get that yeah. a lot. Like, oh, do you ride a bike? Do you ride a bike with your 
baby on the front isn't that dangerous. Um, cycling is not more inherently more dangerous than other forms of transportation. Um, Dr. Teshke's research showed this and there's been lots of subsequent research as well. And so yeah, she, she sort of looked closer at how we perceive the relative safety of um, bicycling, driving, motorcycling, transit, and walking. Oh, I think I've seen this one. Right? Yeah, and yeah. It, so it was a 2013 study and it was focused on British Columbia. It's interesting because it's Canadian results, um, which we don't see a lot. Um, and so the safest mode of travel by far. Walking? Bus transit. <laughs> Bus, right. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, very safe. Um, <laughs> riskiest by far. Motorcycle. Motorcycling. Yeah. Um, driving, walking, and cycling are all sort of intermediate between these. So driving, walking, cycling, have r relatively similar yeah. rates of fatality. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Bus way lower, motorcycle way higher. Yes. Interesting. <laughs> so I have as much risk walking to work as I would riding my bike. There's there's slight differences. <laughs> slight differences. Yeah, I can yeah. I can give you the specifics. Um, but yeah, again, it leads sort of back to this helmet question. Um, why do we have these laws and campaigns promoting helmet use for bikes, but not, not for, for cars <laughs> and not for walking? walking. Oh, I'm walking exactly. on the street. It, people would. That's an absurd question. <laughs> to ask people want to wear a helmet while walking. Yeah. But we but we routinely do it for cyclists. Yeah. Wow. Um, and so just one more way to think about this risk is to calculate the number of trips to incur a single fatality. So Okay. Uh, yeah. So um, the BC data shows that one car driver or passenger died per ten million four hundred seventeen thousand person trips. Okay. One pedestrian died per six million eight hundred three thousand person trips. And one bicyclist died per seven million two hundred forty-six thousand person trips. Person trips, so there's differences, but there's not differences. a lot. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. Yet only one gets pressured to wear a helmet. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Mm, that's fascinating. So that's all really interesting. One of the other questions I had at the start of all this was about risk assessment and like, are we, are humans just really terrible at assessing their own risk? And you looked into that one too, right? I did. Um, Yes, we're bad at calculating risk. We are bad? Okay. Uh, Cut the video. <laughs> and that's, that's because the way we assess risk is complicated, so right. we often screw it up. Um, there's a whole area of science we could dive into here, looking at how assessing risk is deeply embedded in our brains, how we've become especially attuned to detecting potentially dangerous things that are infrequent or novel. Uh, so that leads us to irrationally fear a bear attack or a shark attack. So it seems like we're we're really scared of infrequent novel things like a bear attack, but like routine everyday risks, we just kind of forget about them sometimes. Exactly. All right. Yeah. To me though, this, this is sort of less about us being bad at calculating risk and maybe a little bit more about not having a full picture, complete information to make an informed decision. Oh, that's a very optimistic view on it. <laughs> yes. I, it feels <laughs> like we've, we've been indoctrinated <laughs> into believing if you're a safety conscious cyclist, um, you wear a helmet. Therefore, if you're not wearing a helmet, you don't care about safety, right. making you irresponsible or, in your words, an idiot. <laughs> your words. It was my word, yes. Uh, but there's so much more complexity and nuance to this than that. Just an example, look at Transport Canada's 2011 Road Safety in Canada booklet. So there's a bicyclist section and in there you'll find statistics on how many traffic fatalities are bicyclists. Um, and then you'll read the major safety measure for bicyclists is to wear a helmet that meets safety standards. Where, whereas what we've already we've learned now is that <laughs> you could so have a whole more. chapter that could go into that. Uh, and so it, <laughs> it continues to talk about how um, bicyclists should wear reflective bright colors and oh, protective wow. clothing. Um, <laughs> then it talks about enforcement campaigns. And finally, the very last sentence in a six sentence paragraph says the establishment of separated bike lanes is a way of protecting bicyclists from motorized vehicles. So it almost feels like an afterthought that they talk yeah. about safe, protected bike lanes. Yeah, wow. yeah. Um, and so research shows that the safest infrastructure reduces the risk of having an injury crash by about ninefold, um, and that's significantly higher than the consensus, consensus on the effectiveness of helmets, that they reduce the post-crash risk of head injury by about twofold. Okay, say that again. So safe infrastructure reduces the risk by more than a helmet more. will yeah. prevent you from getting injured. And again, a helmet so, is just once you've crashed, once you've crashed. Whereas, a, whereas safe in infrastructure it should prevent you from, right. from that crash. And like, I'd rather not crash at all than yeah. have a helmet on when I do crash. Yes. Who, who wouldn't? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, another thing to consider here, um, and this is sort of an interesting area, is what psychologists call risk compensation. So that's the idea that people adjust their behavior in response to perceived levels of risk. 
we become more careful when we sense greater risk and less careful when we feel more protected. Uh -huh. So there is some evidence um, out there that simply putting on a helmet can make you feel more protected and thus be less careful. You take more risks when you feel protected. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah. Um, so there's a psychologist at the University of Bath, Dr. Ian Walker, um, and so he's also looked at how just wearing a helmet can nudge drivers into being less careful towards cyclists um, through some pretty interesting experiments. And his research showed car drivers keep more distance from cyclists not wearing a helmet, especially if, they're, if they appear to be female. Um, and in another experiment, he found just wearing a bicycle helmet over a baseball cap um, in a lab can increase risk-taking and sensation-seeking measures. So it's not just the cyclist's perception when they're wearing a helmet, it's everybody else around mm -hmm. them as well changing. Yeah. I think I remember this research. He wore a blonde wig. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> all for good science, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's all really interesting, though, too. So like, like you said at the beginning, there's just way more nuance to this than whether you should wear a helmet or not. Yes. Yeah. yeah. OK, so this is all great info, but what do I do with this? Like, how can this help me make a better decision? Yeah, I think, I think it's about looking at the bigger picture, which is often missed in this debate. If the only question you're asking is, should I wear a helmet? You're probably not asking enough questions. Right. <laughs> Sorry, Tom. <laughs> Safety is more complicated than that. It involves you, the cyclist, but also where you're cycling, the conditions, who else is sharing that space. Um, and so I think individually, we have to ask those questions and also at a broader society level. Instead of only focusing what we're putting on our heads, let's also look at these other factors. Um, and there's another whole piece here we haven't gotten into, and that's helmets as a barrier to people choosing to right. bike. So there's a deterrent effect from helmet laws, and even without helmet laws, just through um, this helmet fixation we've talked about, helmets give off the idea that cycling needs safety equipment. It's not an everyday way to get about. Pushing helmets can promote a sense of danger that just doesn't actually exist, um, which is an issue considering that the research shows the health benefits of biking consistently outweigh the injury risk. Right, yeah, that's a great point. That the, the way that the culture of danger around a helmet influences the way people think, it's probably uh, like even not an intellectual thing, but it just it just feels dangerous sometimes because helmets are helmet a top because you put yeah. a helmet on. Yeah. yeah, I hadn't thought about that before, but that's a great point. Yeah, so I, I think more I think you would agree more people on bikes is a really good thing for health, for the environment, for the safety that comes in numbers. Um, but when we're just focusing on the helmet question, we we miss we lose so much all of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, something I found interesting when I spoke with Dr. Teshki, she suggested trying to not wear a helmet and seeing if I cycle differently. Did I slow down? Did I ride in different places? Um, again, because of our strong helmet culture, we may not even realize how wearing a helmet can change our actions. That's a great point. And in my experience, yeah, I, I absolutely ride differently when I wear a helmet and when compared to when I don't. I, I don't think I've thought about it consciously that way, but I even choose different routes sometimes yeah. if I've got a helmet on or not. Exactly. It's, just a, it's like a whole different way of cycling. It's a different mindset. Exactly, yeah. And so for, for me personally, after doing a deep dive on all this, um, I have changed my behavior. I have always loved the freedom. I feel riding without a helmet, um, but have almost always put on a helmet because I, I feel that pressure. I feel I feel that you feel the pressure to wear a helmet. Yeah, yeah. that helmet helmet culture at play. Um, and so yeah, after after doing this deep dive and, and really diving into all of this, um, I am occasionally choosing to ride helmet free, and I'm not feeling any guilt or shame for that. Uh, and it's great. Oh, what have we what have we done? <laughs> <laughs> I did notice you not wearing a helmet on this ride today. <laughs> because because I was on safe infrastructure. Um, yeah, it really depends on where I'm riding, if I'm going to choose helmet or not. Um, but I feel a lot less bad. About and you have, not you have a more a you have a more well-rounded picture of things, so you feel like you can make a better choice based on the conditions that you're in at that yes. moment. Yeah. Yes. And and when I see other people riding helmets, I don't feel some of the judgment I maybe previously felt either. Right. Oh, that's Which a good thing Which I think all too. comes back to this, like we've been indoctrinated into believing. Helmets are everything, yeah. and there's so much more. There's there's absolutely pressure to wear a helmet. Yeah, and you're a new mom. You take your you ride with your baby on your bike, and even the risk associated with that, you're still feeling comfortable not wearing helmets sometimes. Yes, because of safe bike infrastructure. Yeah. Go Calgary. <laughs> yeah, go Calgary. <laughs> so that is so. Yeah. Coming back to my original question, which was, am I an idiot for not wearing a helmet? I guess maybe the answer then for me to think about is. Maybe sometimes yes, maybe sometimes no. Like it yeah. com maybe comes down to the conditions that we're riding in. And I notice this too, like if I'm mountain biking, 
of course I'm going to wear a helmet. If I'm road cycling or gravel cycling, yeah, I'm wearing a helmet. There's speed, there's vehicles involved. But my commute to work is almost completely on separated bike lanes and pathways. I barely interact with cars at all. I feel pretty com comfortable not. So this feels like a pretty reasonable place to be. Yes. So maybe I'm not an idiot? <laughs> <laughs> I, and I think, I think that's the way you have to look at it, is right. on a maybe a case-by-case -case basis rather than this sort of view of helmet, good, safe, yeah. proper cyclist, and no helmet, bad, irresponsible idiot. It's almost a cultural question, too. It's like, you know, maybe we just all need to be a little less judgmental about this whole thing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We'd yes. all be better off for that, maybe. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Great. Wow, that was interesting. Thank you, Kaylin. This has been great. You're welcome. <laughs> There's our conversation. It's interesting, right? There's just so much more nuance and layers to this than the debate here in North America would suggest. And it kind of blew my mind that even Kaylin reassessed her position on this. I did not expect that. To be honest, I'm not sure how I feel about it. But the question for me is, what am I going to do with this information? So I think on one level, that original question, am I an idiot for not wearing a bike helmet? No, I don't. I don't think I'm an idiot. I feel like what I've been doing is pretty good. But what I'll do in the future is assess the situation that I'm in individually. So every time I go for a ride, I'll think about what's the risk going on? Am I, about, am I mountain biking? Am I road biking? Yeah, I'll probably wear a helmet. Am I riding in an area with lots of cars and mixing with them? Yeah, I'll probably wear a helmet. But if the risk is low and I'm separated from cars and I'm slow and I'm on my upright bike and it feels like the risk is about the same as going for a walk, that seems like a pretty reasonable choice to not wear a helmet in that situation. That's just me. I'm, I'm willing to accept that risk. But I'm not blind to the fact that this channel gives me an audience and that audience is going to keep asking me this question. And to be honest, the easy way out for me, the easiest thing to do would be for me just to wear a helmet in all my videos. End of story, the question would probably just go away. But I don't think that's the right thing to do. If I took anything from this conversation, it might be the fact that the conversation about bike helmets is so dominant that it really pushes out any conversation about any other part of bike safety. All those conversations about making our city safer, about bike lanes, about our attitudes towards cyclists, about the future of transportation, they all get pushed aside when all we think about is helmets. And I think maybe this channel, maybe my bare head, can be a catalyst to open those conversations. Maybe it comes down to this. If someone's asking me why I'm not wearing a helmet and they truly care about, say, bike safety, they're probably not asking the right question. But who knows what will happen? I guess we'll see. One other takeaway, maybe the bigger picture takeaway from this, is that the decision to wear or not wear a bike helmet is a complicated and layered and personal thing. It involves all kinds of decisions and risk assessments that all of us have to make on our own. So maybe the final thought I'll leave you with to everybody is do what you need to do to make the bike a bigger part of your life. The more people who ride, the better your life will be, the better our world will be. If you need to wear a helmet to do that, go ahead. If you don't, then don't. Let's maybe just all just have a bit more empathy and be a little less judgmental when we see somebody who's doing something different than what we choose to do. That's my takeaway from this. Thanks for watching. See you next time.